few weeks ago, or a couple months ago, Kathy gave um, a presentation on how to do presentations. And that included how not to start presentations. And I have decided I will model now how not to start presentations, which is with all kinds of qualifications and excuses. Um, I'm not an expert on Invivo. <laughs> I'm not even close to an expert. Um, I'm still learning in vivo, and so this is going to be uh, me telling you uh, some things that I know, which are in vivo basics, um, and really giving you an overview because it's, an, it's, a, it, it's kind of a um, bloated piece of software. It has a lot of capabilities. Um, uh, it ha some of them are intuitive, and some of them just sort of follow the logic that's internal to in vivo that you have to figure out, and they can um, move across sections of the software. Um, and there's a lot of things in Invivo um, that I don't know about. And so this isn't a training. This is really an overview. Um, and I wanted to start by asking, who's used Invivo before? A very long time ago. A very long time ago. Do you even know what version you used? No. So Invivo is made by a company called QSR. And they, it's the latest version of what way back was called Nudist. And um, then I think was called N2, and then there have been lots of different versions of, um, of in vivo. Um, <clears throat> um, so what is this thing that we're going to talk about and what can it do? It helps you work with a range of types of qualitative data by collecting them into one place, by organizing them, by helping you to analyze them, to visualize them, and then to report out on these data. Um, but it's more than that. I kind of I feel like I'm really I'm not like a QSR rep here. Um, when I say oh, it's more than that, um, it's more than that. And, and in our group and in, in the work that I've done with Invivo in the past, I have I haven't been using it to its full capacity. And I feel like it's you know the the way they say we use ten percent of our brains. So like I'm using three percent of Invivo or something. So it's not just about bringing your data in and helping you organize your data and make sense of it. Um, you can you can use it um, to to centralize all kinds of aspects uh, and components of your project. So secondary literature reviews can be inside of InVivo. Um, you can have all kinds of memos to yourself about your developing analysis. Um, you can have a project log, a methodological log. And um, in the work that I, in the way that I've used InVivo, I haven't done that, and I wish that I had. There's also ways of tracking multi-user use if you're, um, if you're working in a group. And I've done a little bit of that, again, not to its, its full um, capacity. In vivo is expensive. Um, the current version in vivo 9, if you buy it just as like a single user without any kind of institutional discount or something, it's $650. So there are other kinds of, so there are other software packages that do the, that do similar things to in vivo that I can't really talk about, but you know, like Atlas TI. There's open source stuff. Um, you know, it's not going to have the same level, kinds of capabilities necessarily, and certainly isn't going to have the same kind of support. One thing that I've been pretty impressed with is um, in vivo the, the support. Um, I was just telling somebody a couple of years ago I had a problem with um, I I don't I don't remember what it was. I couldn't open my in vivo or something, and then I realized that it was something that was screwy with the operating system with an update. But I'd, I'd sent in an inquiry to QSR about you know, having problems with my in vivo. And they wouldn't leave me alone. I mean, from Australia, they kept contacting me and saying, have you solved your problem? We want to get this solved. Um, so um, you know, I finally said, yes, I solved my problem. And it didn't have anything to do with you. In vivo is run in Windows. Um, so if you're a Mac user, you need to use Boot Camp or Parallels or something like that. It's run in a Windows environment. Um, there's also, um, uh, as this is, I'm just going to say this, even though I'm not sure exactly what it means, but I found this. So Citrix, if people are uh, familiar with the company Citrix, Citrix ha um, supports um, visualization um, for use across a broader range of platforms, like you can use it on your um, iPad without running, without running a Windows environment, um, <coughs> and for remote use. And there's a new, with, with Invivo 9, which is the latest version of Invivo, there's a, a product or a service called Invivo 9 Server. You still have to buy the software. It's for um, multiple users simultaneous use. 
It's not cloud computing. It's hosted on a local server. Um, and uh, so that's something new if you're working in a group that you might want to find out about. Again, I have no idea how expensive that is. And there are other probably other workarounds. Um, I've worked in a group using Invivo. Um, of course, I, we've used Dropbox. It doesn't. If you're both trying to work in the project, project at the same time, you get conflicting copies like with anything in Dropbox. So um, that, that can be a problem. Um, this is in Vivo 8. It's, um, and I'm gonna, I'll show you this is in Vivo 9. Um, it looks a little cleaner. Um, they have lots of the same, um, I'm going to mostly work in Vivo 8. They have lots of the same capabilities. Some things that are new in Vivo 9. Let me find my notes. So with, with just a few minor exceptions, I guess, um, Vivo 9 will do everything that Vivo 8 will do. Some things that it does um, that Vivo 8 doesn't do, it works with bibliographic um, software, bibliographic programs like EndNote, Zotero, Web, RevWorks. You can just import stuff directly into it. And Vivo 8 doesn't do that. It allows you to import and code spreadsheets and databases. So if you're using maybe interview data um, or focus group data and then a survey, you can import the survey data easily. In Vivo 8 doesn't let you do that. <coughs> um, and it has some more sophisticated kinds of visualization tools for visualizing your data, um, like you can make word clouds and things that people like to do now. Um, but like I said, I'm mostly going to demonstrate what Invivo does using Invivo 8, and I might toggle over to Invivo 9. I don't have any of my data in there. Um, oh, and if everybody, anyone's interested in trying it out, just go to the QSR website, just Google Invivo, and you can download a full copy of Invivo 9 for 30 days. And then if you decide you want to buy it, you don't have to reinstall it. They'll just, um, ex you know, they'll just make the, um, the license permanent. Okay, so this is, this, is what ha this is what it looks like when you open Invivo 8. And you get a list of recent projects. So these are, this is the deliberation project that, um, that Barbara was talking about, where we ran six deliberative groups um, over a period of time. Um, this is a project, is strangely named, it, the, naming, the name has to do with the funding. Um, this is a project where a student and I um, looked at a bunch of websites for parents of transgender and gender variant kids, and we brought in material from the websites and coded them. This is from the same project, I could merge these two, that looks at newspaper articles about transgender kids. And then this is uh, sample data for a tutorial, and this is an earlier oops, an, of the deliberation work. So I'll just open one of these projects. If you were just starting from scratch, you would click on new project down here, um, and you would make your own project. Okay, I don't know why it's being so slow. Okay, so this is the basic look, and you can, you can move things around. Across the top, you have a bunch of toolbars. So this is kind of set up like Outlook. Does anybody here use Outlook? I don't really like the layout, but it's what it is. It's not my favorite layout. It feels really cluttered. You can get rid of some of the toolbars if you want to. Um, so you have, um, you have toolbars across the top, uh, and you have the navigation bars across the side. And then this is the what they call the detailed view section. This is really where you work. Um, so I'm just going to go down the side, the areas that I'm going to talk about in more detail. Sources are your data. And that's the primary thing that, um, that sources are, but also um, any other project materials um, that you want to import and store. So you could have secondary literature there. Um, you could have um, memos to yourself, um, etc. So here, 
If you look at internals, which means data that is stored inside the program, we have all of our all of the workshops that we ran. So these were sort of, you know, they they're kind of like focus groups where we convened 10 to 12 people. Um, and what we have here are the transcripts. So if I double click on any one of these, it's going to pull up the transcript from that day. You can uh, bring in uh, several different kinds of data. I've only worked with text data. You can bring in um, video data. You can bring in audio data. You can bring in images. And um, you can bring in PDFs. And you can also transcribe right inside of in vivo. I'm not 100% clear on what is the um, extra value in that. Um, but I'll show you what something that's been transcribed in in vivo looks like. So now I'm in in vivo 9. I'm going to open a project. You can see the look is, this, is, is largely the same as in vivo 8. Down the side, some of the categories are a little bit different, but we start with sources. And so this, um, Helen, is audio. If I double click on her, you can see the audio recording across the top. And in, in Viva, if you code, um, I'm sorry, if you transcribe inside of Enviva, you can set um, a time span where it will make divisions. So you can you know, scroll through and get to different um, periods of time in the interview. How much editing did you have to do between what it heard and what it typed out? No, it's not voice recognition software. It's it, you can use it to transcribe. You do the transcription. Oh, okay. So it will recognize a pedal. So that's why I'm saying I don't know what, if there's a lot of added value in transcribing inside. I yeah, it's not, it is not voice recognition software. You have to buy, add on a few hundred dollars and buy Dragon, I guess. Um, so, um, but it will, it will recognize a transcription pedal. Um, so you can use it the same way that you might use, um, I'm trying to remember what I used when I transcribed stuff. I, I used something that was just open source scribe or something like that. Um, you can, uh, I'm gonna talk about coding in a second. You can code on the text, you can code on the audio, you can code on the video, you can code on a picture. So you can code across these different um, media sources that you, that you can import. Okay. Let's see. So I'm back in Invivo 8, where I'm a little more comfortable. Um, if you look... So here we have all of our workshops. We don't have anything under externals. Externals are um, sources that uh, you want to include in your project, but that you don't have imported into your project. So maybe a book, right, where you're not, there's no real way to bring all of that text in. Um, so you might have a summary of it that you've put in, and then you can actually code on that if you want to, or at least you have it stored in your project. Another thing that, again, you see we have just empty here, and I wish we didn't, is memos. Um, memos can be freestanding, or they can be linked to any, um, anything inside of the project. So if we go back over to 9 and click on memos here and open it up, they have they put um, some of their literature there. They have progress reports where they're tracking what they're doing. Let's open one of these. A chronological history of the progress of the project. That seems like an excellent idea. Um, team memos. So here you see there's EDR and HGP and WWS, which are referring to either different members or different, different teams within the project group, um, having separate research journals. So this is a great place to just track from day to day what you've done. I mean, probably many of us um, do that with our research um, 
in you know ways that we've already sorted out. I know I do using in vivo. I have because I wasn't really aware of this um, capability. I have in you know a word document that's my research journal or my methods journal, or I'll have a student do that. Um, and you can put it inside of the project, and then you can. One of the good things about that, there's a few good things about that. If you have multiple users who are um, working on a project like we do in this project, or I'm sorry, not this project, but the one that I just had up. This is the um, example in ViewNR. Um, you can each access that, or you can have um, re um, logs that stand next to one another where you can see what other people have done. Now I know there's you know there's ways to do that if you have a shared file in Dropbox and you're all accessing a Word file, but this just puts everything together. But also you can go into your memos and you can code them with themes and link it back to your data that way. So a theme that you are coding for in your data, you could also code for in your memos where you're discussing what you may be thinking about that. Um, you could also code in your secondary literature for themes that you're looking for in your data. So, you know, if, um, if I'm doing, like in the project that I talked about where we were looking at um, websites um, for, uh, websites <coughs> for parents of trans and gender variant kids, one of the, one of the things that we code for is different um, definitions and ideas about childhood because that is an important theme that we see throughout and that we say is doing certain things. So um, if we had the secondary literature in there, we could code for places in the secondary literature where people are, you know, previous work that's been done on that, and then we could just bring it all up together, which you can imagine how that would be helpful when you're in, in process of analysis or when you're writing things up. Okay. So, um, how do you get stuff in there? You can just copy and paste. You can click on an open space. So right now I'm in sources here. The specific <coughs> kinds of sources that I'm in are internals and workshops. You get the logic of you start down here on this navigation, you move up here. And so then I'm over here in my works. Right click on an open space. You'll get a box that opens up that allows you to do a new document, for instance. You could give it a name, and you can put a description in. So this is basically a data source. So let's not put test on. This might be interview with Barbara. If you wanted to, you could put a description in. Um, it shows that KB, that's me, is the person who did this. Um, and that's, that can be important when you're um, working with multiple users. Okay, so if I click OK, I'm going to get just a blank source that opens. But you can also, I'm just going to delete this. And so then you could copy, um, you could copy and paste stuff into there, you could work directly in it yourself, um, whatever. You can also, though, import internals. So I'm going to go to Browse. I'm just going to go to a place where I know that I have stuff. It's not actually, it's not data for this project, just where I know I have. I go to one of my classes where I have them do weekly briefs. OK, I don't, I don't like that one. It has folders in it. OK. So I can highlight all of these and click Open. And it's going to bring them all in. And if I open one of these, there it is. Oh, Eric did excellent. I did it before. before. Um, so uh, it uh, actually in the graded the graded briefs I have like tons of track change comments that did not show up. But um, you know the text is there, and if you're bringing in interviews that you've transcribed someplace else or that you've sent out to a transcription service, um, there they all are. Yeah. Does this uh, have its own document type, or does it make word files out of the stuff? What, what, what? No, I think it has its. I'm not sure actually. You can export stuff as word files. Oh. Um, yeah, I don't know the answer to that. Carl. Yeah. These all have a modified by and a modified date. 
Is there a capability to go and see what the mo modifications were? or Not to my knowledge, them? no. No. So it tracks who's been doing what, um, so who created it, um, the most recent modification date, who it was most recently modified by. So these were all, I guess I've worked in all of these. Um, how many nodes, nodes are themes, or, um, yeah, nodes are, nodes are themes. They're what you use to code the data, and I'm going to move to there in just a second. Um, and then the number of references, the number of pieces of data that are coded at any one of the nodes. So all that information is here. Okay, so that's kind of an introduction to sources, to, how you, to, to what you can include in sources. The major component is it's where you keep your data. I mean, that's probably the most important thing. That's the only thing that I've used it for, but you can use it for more, like I said. Um, it's a, a great place to keep journaling um, and records um, that are project records. Um, so does anyone have any questions? Maybe I'll just stop at each point and ask if people have questions about what that is, how you use it. So those are the basics, okay. So, let's move to notes. <clears throat> Nodes, like I said, are the themes that um, you use to code your data. So you've just you've brought in all this data. Maybe you just did 30 interviews with people for your dissertation, and you transcribed them all, or you had somebody transcribe them, and you just and you just imported them the way that I was just showing you. Now, what are you going to do with all of that? So the whole point of this is to try to make sense of this like voluminous data that you can't hold in your head all at once. Well, you, you start out by trying to um, look for themes that are in your data. Um, so one way that you can do that is you may already have themes of interest that you, you probably already do have themes of interest. So you can just develop nodes um, on your own. Wow, this goes way down. Let me find some white space. You can um, do a new free node. Free node means a freestanding node. It's not in a hierarchy with another node. I'll get to tree nodes, which are hierarchical nodes, in just a minute. Um, and I'll say that in, in Vivo 9, which I guess anybody here who is going to get in Vivo um, would probably get, doesn't use the same exact terminology. They just, instead of, so here the nodes are already pre-classified. They just give you a node category, and you can build your own, own folders. So you could have, um, you know, uh, I'm going to talk about auto-coding. You could have auto-coded nodes. You could have, you know, the different kinds of categories. And then you can build either freestanding or hierarchical within there. So it's the same logic. You still have freestanding, hierarchical nodes, um, and then um, attributes and cases, which I'll get to in a second. But um, I'm going to stay in a Vivo 8 for right now. So you could create another, a, a free node of, that's a theme of interest um, on your own. Again, the, so the dialog box looks similar to the one that I brought up earlier to um, create a, a source. Um, name, description. Description here I think is pretty important, especially if you are um, working with multiple users. So, I don't know, um, I can look to um, like uncertainty and unknowability. Okay, the person who, I'm going to open the free node properties, the person who created that probably knew what they meant by that, and that may seem sort of obvious, um, but it may be a little bit unclear, uncertain, um, especially if you have multiple users who are coding uh, using this, this same node, who are coding on the same theme. Or even to yourself, I find that um, I, I may start coding in, in a project, and I'll get partway through, and or I've been away from it for a couple weeks because I, I was traveling or for whatever reason, and all of a sudden I say to myself, now what what exactly was I trying to do with that node? What was the point of that? And you can pull the node up and look at the coding you've done and tell yourself, oh yeah, I'm coding in this way or that way. So I might put something in about how wide I'm going in my coding. Um, so actually, I can pull up some codes that I just developed. So one thing that I just put in was a whole bunch of codes that I started with RP for risk perception. These are um, 
uh, things that would um, indicate, things that likely predict um, the level of, of perceived risk. Um, so here, let me just open the free node properties. And then I put in a note to myself, I don't think I coded very consistently for this in terms of the social side of irreversible. So I ended up telling me that I need to go back and fix that. Um, and so, um, but this gives me a sense of how I was using this node. Okay. So um, you have free nodes, you have tree nodes, which are in a hierarchical relationship. So you have parent nodes, body, and here you have uh, sub sub nodes underneath those, and you can. I don't think I'm gonna like go into the technical details of how to do this, but you can merge these together. You can move them around. You can make something that was a free node into put it into hierarchical relationship with another node. Um, you can make something that was a child node into a freestanding node or into a parent node. You can move everything around. So it's it's really. Um, uh, it, it, it sort of grows and blossoms with the project itself. You don't have to feel scared about being locked into these, you know, what are going to be inchoate categories to begin with. I've made that mistake of feeling like when I sat down with a project and with this software that I needed to know what I was, gonna, what I was doing with, with, with these categories. But really you can be very sort of rough and open and refine as you go, which is how the research um, process works. There were hands up. Yes. Can you click on one of those tree nodes again? Do you care which one? No, I don't care. Okay, corporations. Okay, so under those those two, the distrust of corporations and responsibility, do those originate as free nodes and then lock them in there? Or? I don't know. I'm I mean, not sure. Okay, I didn't. So I didn't develop this to. coding. No, no, no. They don't need to. You can. So, you can build. So I. So in a project where I built most of the coding structure, which is not this project, but in another project, some stuff we just built from the beginning as tree nodes. And then can you have, can like distrust of corporations also go under risk? Do you, or do you, do you, you would to, copy it. You, you would copy it, but then, so a lot of stuff in Invivo is not dynamic. So if you copied this and moved it to risk, as you code things here, they don't code here. You'd have to code it both. So you can kind of, so one thing you can do is wait till you're, really sort of at the end and then do a lot of that kind of stuff. If you do it midstream, you need to remember, you need to put in your log, which should be in your, in your project here, what exactly you've done, and you need to either keep adding, um, or you, yeah, you need to keep adding or know sort of where, you, where, where that happened and what that means for the future. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. But in this project, so we had a coding manual that's not in in vivo that had us in, um, and we were trying to achieve integrated reliability with it informally. But you can see corporation would have been a category we had early on um, in May of 2010. Um, and, but then the finer grained subcategories within it may emerge in a later analysis and get added in. That would tend to be the more usual way. You start out with a broader category and discover it has too many permutations and you need to right, sub slice it sub up. Subcategories, yeah. and that's yeah. what this allows you to do. Uh -huh. but that, one other thing is you notice that corporations, that there's six sources here with 77 places that it's co coded for distrust. And six, so, so all, all six workshops that we did, six here coded at um, 19 places, um, and nothing up in the parent node. So you can, I'm not gonna, I, I don't remember exactly how you do it. I looked, I got it in a training. There's um, something that you can click on to add in the hierarchy where it, where it um, aggregates. So um, you can do that after the fact. I mean, you could also open these and highlight everything and code them to this, but there's actually, which would take you a minute, but you can do it in just a couple seconds. So yes. is your... Oh, I'm sorry, okay. I'll get to you in a second. No, go ahead, Kathy. No, is your overall text then in corporations and then under those subcategories, is it only the coded text? It's just the coded text. I'm going to pull up the coding in just a second um, and show you what it looks like when you pull a node. Yeah. So basically, what you're do, what you do, what, after you've developed nodes, or as you're developing nodes, we're gonna get there, you're 
then you're going through your data and you're coding the data. You're highlighting sections of it and you're coding it at these various nodes. Yeah? My question is about the previous thing that you showed, which was the description and uh, the descriptions for the nodes. And I'm wondering if it's possible to export those in a neat way, like as a table or something, or oh. if you have to maintain that separately. Um, so there's, there, there is. Um, so, um, do you want me to do you want me to like figure out once again how to do it, or can I just say that there is? So, so there's an export option and there's a print option. It'll bring up a dialog box, and then you can either have it export just a list of the nodes, or you can have it do um, a list with like the information of how much coding there is, or and with um, with node properties. So you can have all of that exported and printed. So yeah, you can get a list. You don't have to just like do a print screen or something, and yeah, that would be pretty icky. Yeah, definitely. Okay, any other questions about the free notes and the tree notes? So one thing that you can do is you can start by um, developing a sort of rough coding structure of pre-existing categories that you're interested in. But you can also just go straight to the data and find out some of what's there um, to help you develop themes of interest and maybe some things that you um, haven't seen before, that you, that you aren't expecting to be there. Um, and a way to do that is to run a query. There's um, a whole bunch of different kinds of queries that you can run. Text search, word frequency, a coding query, a matrix coding query. Uh, a compound query, which I don't know how to use, and a coding comparison query. And then in Avivo 9, there's a, um, a group um, query. <coughs> so this is just asking a question directly of either the full set or some subset of your, um, of your data, of your sources. You can, you can work across different project components. There's a couple of these that you can use without having done any coding, without having developed any coding categories, even if you'd like. So, one is a text search. And for a text search, you're going to be putting in um, a word that you're interested in. So what I'm gonna start with, though, is a word frequency search. So let's say you just imported a bunch of, well, let's say that you just imported a bunch of uh, workshops, six workshops, in fact, because that's the data that we've got here. Um, and you can just sort of, you know, uh, apply that to whatever you're working on. And you haven't, you haven't developed any kind of coding structure yet. So what you might do is a text search to see what's there in your data. I'm not going to do a thousand because, like I said before, in vivo, at least the way that it works, or maybe my computer's, um, I don't think I need to do this. Uh, maybe my computer's not power, powerful enough, but sometimes it really does sort of bog down and just, uh, it's trying to get the work done. So I, um, if you don't have to ask it to get the thousand most frequent words, which I'm probably not going to look through anyway, um, you might want to switch that. So let's do the top 25 words with a minimum length of maybe four letters. And let's go to items and selected folders. Internals workshops, that's where our data is, right? Because we're interested in what's in our data. So if I had all those memos and whatnot, um, I wouldn't want to search in those, so I wouldn't be clicking this. We know that there's nothing there because I already showed you how we kind of didn't do that. But um, you want to get the results that you want. You don't want to get every result that it could return. So this button, add to project, will add the query, so the query criteria to your project. It will save it under queries. It doesn't save the results. You can save the results, but it doesn't save the results. So you, this way you, you don't have to build these criteria over and over again if it's something that you think you're going to use more than once. I'm not going to do that right now. I'm just going to show you how you can 
get things out of this. So here it's working, working, working. Barbara. <laughs> so um, is there anything of interest? Maybe not. Maybe we need more letters. But you can see how this could be a place for you to start. Um, another query that you can do, like I said before, is a, tech, um, a text search. So, um, what's a word that we might be interested in? Harm. Harm? Okay, how about risk? And you can put in um, all kinds of operations. I'll show you um, in a second what you can do in Vivo 9, because in Vivo 9, Lay, I wanted to talk about using a about um, having multiple users who are working in a project, because that's something that, that we're working with. Um, like I said, I think especially in those cases, um, it would be um, incredibly important for you to be having research logs and whatnot that are accessible to everyone and that are updated by everyone. So, you know, using the memos um, in a way that we didn't here. Um, but you could, there are also things that you can do where you can check um, co uh, coding, you can compare coding um, and whatnot. And one of the ways, so one of the things that your project includes, if you look in project properties, is a list of users. Now, everybody here is, you know, affiliated with the university. <coughs> one thing that you want to be really careful with if you're using in vivo, um, not so much if you're just using it for yourself, but I think this is a good step to include, but especially if you're using it with other people and you're working on university computers, is to make sure that your computer is, uh, is logging you in as yourself. Um, so we have Christine, Jennifer, Julie, and Carl, and Rachel Cranfield did a ton of coding on this, and I don't know if she was using in vivo on a computer that just wasn't assigned to her, that wasn't signed in as her. Um, I don't know how she's not showing up here, but there's no RC here, and there's no way to know what coding she did and to get her in. She's under one of these other ones. So if you, if you have a full set of coding that you know is under the wrong name, you can reassign that name. So for example, I'll show you a different um, project in a second. I um, worked with, it was just me and one student, I worked with her on a project. She had done most of the coding, and then I started to do coding. And she had worked on my computer, and we, ch we learned about these names. Um, but she had worked signed in just as herself. She also worked um, onto my computer because I had a user profile for her. So everything was coded to her, not to me. But she also worked in one of the computer labs. And so there was actually another permutation of her name that was in there. And you can combine those. Um, and let's say that it had said, you know, instead of it being signed into her in the lab, it said like CSB21, the name of the lab. Um, we could have reassigned that to her, um, to her name. But here, we have no idea what Rachel was working under, and it's obviously combined with some coding that these people actually did, so there's, there's nothing to be done about that right now. Actually, we can recover. We can recover that? Because they weren't simultaneously coding. Yeah, but um, I don't know. Well, that would mean going through and like knowing dates, and I don't even know if we can do that in InVivo. I don't know if InVivo can do it. Um, I'm just going to show you how you can do some iterator reliability stuff. So this is a project where um, we coded advocacy groups, uh, advocacy group websites for parents of transgender and gender variant kids. The users are me and Claire, the student who I worked with. So we're the only ones in there. <coughs> Hooray. So let's go to queries. And let's do a coding comparison query. We could, again, we could add this to the project. The query criteria would be saved. So you don't have to build this over and over again. I'm not going to do that right now. So we can select our user group A. Let's say we had like 
15 people who are working in this project in teams, we could check, you know, five names, and so we could aggregate users. So we're going to compare me to Claire. And see, I'm grayed out. You can't compare yourself to yourself. Yeah. So I don't want to compare us at all nodes. For one thing, it's going to bog the machine down. But also, I didn't code at everything. I just coded at a few things. So let's do fixed or fluid, which referred to discussions where uh, there was some discussion of uh, either or both the, the fixed and fluid nature of gender. So we have that in. And let's not do all sources. Um, let's do sources in selected folders, internals, and oh no, let's just do gender spectrum, which is one advocacy group that I know I coded. Okay. You can display a Kappa coefficient, and percentage agreement is, you'll see, I'm not that thrilled about what they do with that. So let's run it. And this is what you get. So um, here are all the sources. A lot of the 100% agreements are because we didn't code anything at that. Right? Some of the Kappa coefficients are really low. So Kappa, the Kappa coefficient shows the likelihood, um, comparing the likelihood of, of randomly hitting on the same thing. So like if we were both blindfolded and given highlighters, and there's this source that we're coding on the wall, and we go over there, like what is the, the likelihood of that compared to what we actually did? <clears throat> um, with zero being marking on the wall, and one being um, perfect. So where we actually did coding, some of it isn't great um, in terms of Kappa coefficients. I think it's because I coded really differently. Remember I said that when I first started coding, I was coding very widely. Um, but also, there are some, some things that we um, just coded differently. And so that can be an opportunity to talk on the team to refine what the criteria are um, some of you will need the iterator reliability, the uh, Kappa coefficient for your, you know, to report out your data to, to publish it. Some of you won't, but it's still, um, having this is still a good tool to be able to go back and, um, you know, talk with your, with your research team. I know that I can click on various things, and the, here the, um, the source that I just clicked on, this source right here came up, and the coding stripes, one for me, and one for, one for me, and one for, oh, that's weird. Oh, I'm, you know what, I'm coded at, I'm, I am two different users. I need to be combined. Um, oh, no, I'm not, I'm sorry. This is, the, this is the coding for the node. So here where it's light pink, you can see that it's, um, you know, it's less dense than the dark pink where we both coded at the same thing. And here you have Claire's coding stripe, and Claire is, like I said, more discerning than I am. I was doing the wider coding, which maybe wasn't that useful. So, but you can see, so some places I coded and she didn't, lots of places I coded and she didn't, some places we both coded. This could be, again, an opportunity to discuss, to refine, to systematize your work at the group level. So it's 2.25, and I've like thrown a lot of information that just gives you some ideas of the capabilities. I wanted to stop, and um, it's, that's not everything that I know about in vivo, but it's actually a lot. <laughs> and that's probably, you know, 8% of what it does. Um, but I'm, so those are some of the main, main sorts of operations. It's not the specific details that I know I got into details, but it's not the specific details that are important. It's trying to like extrapolate from me going through a, a specific kind of query to, to, to give you a sense of what you can do with, you know, your data, the kinds of things that Invivo could help you with. Um, like I said, it has tons of capabilities, and just like any other tool, one of the things that the Invivo trainers um, harped on uh, was just because it can do it doesn't mean it should do it. It can, it can and it can help you with um, some of the things that it can do can help you with figuring out when you're at saturation by using some text search and comparing them to your coding, so knowing when to stop 
and move on to the next step. Um, so anyway, I feel like I've reached saturation with you all. I want to stop and see if there are any questions.